Okay, so we are working through question one here, and we're gonna slowly work our way through it, and hopefully by the end of it, you feel really confident. And we're going to be looking at the examiner's report as well for each question. So firstly, consider the quartic f of x is equal to this, our domain is all row numbers, and a part of the graph of y equals f of x below. So they have drawn it for us here, perfect. A, find the coordinates of the point M at which the minimum, the minimum value of the function F occurs. It's worth one mark, so that just means we have to write down our answer. And we're finding the coordinate of this point right here. So we are going to find the coordinate of this point, which is our minimum. To do this, we're going to use our trusty CAS, and we're just going to put this in there first. So we're going to define that. So we come over here, and we're going to begin by going F of X, then I hit control this button, and now I'm just going to type this in. So 3x raised to the 4 plus 4x cubed minus 12x squared. Perfect. Double check that you've written that correctly. That looks good. If I want to find the minimum, there are many different ways I could go about it, but perhaps the easiest in this case would be going menu, calculus, and then we can go function minimum. And I'm going to go f of x and I want to know the x value for which the minimum occurs, it's going to be negative two. Now remember, I want the coordinates. So that means what I'm going to have to do is now go f of negative two to get the output is going to be negative 32. And with that, we have our very first answer. So it's going to be negative two is my x value, negative 32 is my y value. So this point right here is negative two, negative 32, perfect. If we look at our examiner's report right here, so I'll make this nice and big for us. I'll get my highlighter. As you can see, 95% of students got the full one mark here. The answer is negative two, negative 32, which you can see here. And they write, this question was answered well. Some students only gave the X value when coordinates were required. So make sure you read that word coordinates uh, well, read it properly, so you provide what you need to provide. Okay, let's shrink that back up. All right, the, the other way you could approach this question is by graphing it. So if you wanted to, control doc add graphs, and you could go f of x. So remember, we have defined it, that f is bold, and there it is right there. Now, it's we can't really see it all there, so you might want to change your window size. So window zoom, window settings. Let's go negative 5, 5, and we already know that the minimum y value is going to be negative 32. So let's just go down to there, and let's just go up to... And with that, we now have a bit of a better look at what we're dealing with. So let's come here, just like that, perfect. Um, now, if we wanted to find the minimum value, this one right here, we would go function, analyze graph, minimum, sweep across it, and there it is right there, negative two, negative 32. Just another way to think about it if you want. All right, let's keep on going. B, it says, State the values of B, in which B is a real number, for which the graph Y equals F of X plus B has no X intercepts. All right, so what is this B doing? We're plussing B to the function. Well, hopefully you know that this B here is going to be causing a vertical translation. So we have to figure out how big does this vertical translation have to be in order for us to have no x-intercepts. Well, let's come and look at this here. And you can very much visualize this. We need to make sure our minimum value is greater than zero. We need to move it up. In other words, 32 spaces. We need it to be up here. So we just need to move the minimum above the x-axis. So we can visualize this on our CAS. So I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna go tab, and I'm going to go f of x. That's what I'm dealing with, whoops, f of x, and I'm going to move it 32 up. If I move it 32 up, I now am going to get this red graph up here. Let's move it. And as you can see, it's above my x-axis, but let's read the question very carefully. It says there are no x-intercepts. Now, at the moment, because I've only moved it 32 up, if I check for x-intercepts for this red graph here, you can see I have one. And that's a problem because we shouldn't have any x intercepts at all. So that means what the value of b has to be, the value of b has to be greater than 32. So b has to be greater 
than 32 in order for it to not touch the x-intercept at all. Another way you could write this is b is an element of 32 to infinity, making sure you put a round bracket if you use this notation and make sure you just have that greater than and not an equal to sign there. So these are just two alternative ways of writing down the answer. Let's now look at our examiner's report here. Let's get the highlighter. 65% of people got the full one mark here. There is the answer, which we have written. This question was answered well. Common incorrect answers were this, this. Okay, so I think, I feel this would be a common incorrect error, including the 32. Uh, so too over here. Well, they've gone 33 there. So they've just rounded up, which is a big no-no. Uh, others used the X coordinates and gave X is greater to than two as their answer. Okay. Strange what people do. Okay. So that is how you would approach that. All right. Let's get rid of this. Let's minimize this and let's keep chugging along. Next question. Part of the line L, sorry, part of the tangent L to y equals f of x at x is equal to negative one over three is shown below. So here we have this tangent L right here and it's tangent at x equals negative one third. So let's put that in. So at this point right here, at this point right here, it is negative one over three. Okay, so if we want to find the equation of the tangent, the equation of this tangent, how are we going to go about it? Well, let's for a moment just look here. It's only worth one mark, which so far everything has just been worth one mark. Uh, because it's only worth one mark, we don't have to show any of our working. And that really means you have to use your CAS efficiently to answer this in a productive way. So we come over here and what we're going to do is go menu. We're going to go calculus and we're going to go tangent line. We then are going to go f of x comma when x is equal to negative one over three, close our brackets, hit enter. And there is our answer just like that. So again, it's only worth one mark. So we just need to write down what that is. So we come over here, we're going to grab a pencil and we're going to go. Now the tangent is L. So, and it says, write the equation. So you have to write L of X, or you could write Y is equal to, but let's just go L of X. Cause that's kind of what they've given us over nine plus 41 over 27. That is going to be your answer. Only one mark. Let's look at the examiner's report here and see what they have done for us. So what have they said here? So as you can see, 73% of people got the full one mark here and they have written L of X is equal to that, which was what we have written here. An equation and exact values were required. So that means if you didn't include L of X is equal to, or if you didn't include Y is equal to, you would have lost the one mark because it needed to be written as an equation. All right, let's rub all that out and let's minimize that and let's keep on going. Whoops, this one needs to be minimized. All right, so next. The tangent line L intersects Y equals F of X at X is equal to negative one third and at two other points. State the X values of the two other points of intersection. Express your answer in the form, this right here, where A, B, and C are integers. Okay, so let's come up and look at our graph again just to really visualize what's going on. So we know that this point right here is negative one over three, but now we need to find this point and we need to find this point. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, obviously, if I was to come here for a moment, we're going to solve when f of x is equal to l of x uh, for my x values. So let's come here for a moment and we're going to begin by defining what l of x is. So l of x control this, then I come up here, hit enter, bring that down. Now that is defined as L of X. And now I'm going to go menu, algebra, solve, and I'm gonna go L of X is equal to F of X. And I'm solving that for my X values, hit enter. And I'm giving, I'm given these things right here. Now take note of the fact that we just need to state the X values of the two other points. We don't need coordinates. So that means what we're going to give as our answer is this one and this one, but it has to be written in this form. So the plus and the minus. So you have to make sure that you read this carefully. Now the CAS always factors out a negative here. 
So these right here can be rewritten as x is equal to negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 42 over 3. So you just have to make sure you read those carefully. Put that negative back in there and you can see that is going to be your answer. So in this instance, a is going to be negative 1, b is going to be 42, and c is going to be 3. We've got a line of working and we've got the solution because it's a two marker. Let's now come down here and look at the examiner's report. As you can see, 67% of people got the full two marks. They have written solve L of X is equal to F of X for X and X is equal to what we have written here. Exact values were required. There were many sign errors. So what they're referring to there, I imagine, is that people were not considering that they had factored out a negative and just made silly mistakes. And as you can see here, people did not make that one a negative one. Uh, some students found the values of X where the gradient of L was equal to the gradient of F. So people just not reading the question. But the biggest issue I based on this, it seems, was the sign errors. So don't make those silly mistakes. Let's keep on going now. It now says find the total area of, actually, let me shrink this back up. Let me grab my highlighter. It says find the total area of the regions bounded by the tangent L and Y equals F of X. Express your answer in the form this, where A, B, C are positive integers. Okay, so let's come up and look at our graph because that's always helpful. We know that this point right here is negative one minus the square root of 42 over three. And we know that this point up here is negative one plus the square root of 42 over three. Those are our points. Perfect. Now what we're going to do is we are trying to find the area bounded by the tangent and the curve. So we're trying to find this. Now we don't have to break up, we're dealing with integrals, we don't have to break up the integral here. We can treat it as one big thing. So that means we don't really have to worry about this one right here. We're just gonna start here and end there. So let's come down and see how many marks this is worth. It's worth two marks. So we're going to need some working out here. And the working out is going to look something like this. Uh, we're gonna say my area is going to be equal to now it's minus one plus the square root of 42 on three, minus one minus the square root of 42 on three. And then it's going to be the higher one minus the lower one. So my tangent is on top, the curve is down the bottom, then D of X. So just to show you what I mean by that, so if we come up here, you can see that my L of X is above my F of X. So that's why I've put them in that order there. So be careful with that. Now we're going to chuck that into our CAS calculator to see what we get. Uh, the quickest way to bring up the integral sign is shift plus. And then what you're going to do, another trick is we can just highlight this, bring it down there, click there, highlight this, bring it down there, come here. And now all of these are defined for me already. So L of X minus F of X, then hit X there, D of X. And that is going to be my answer. It's going to be seven, eight, four, the square root of 42 over 135. Let us now look at the examiner's report and see how people went with this question. So let's bring this open here. 49% of, 49 of people got the full two marks. And as you can see there, there is our working here. Negative one plus root, good, good, good. L of X minus F of X, they have brackets. Let's put some brackets there. D of X is equal to seven, eight, four, the square root of 42, one, three, five. That looks good. So make sure you, let's just follow VCAR to a T there and put those brackets in. Let's read this. Students who answered question 1D correctly were generally able to answer this question correctly because remember you needed these terminal points which we got from up here. So if you didn't answer this one, you were in real trouble for this one. Uh, some students split the integral, which was unnecessary. Others put a negative sign in front of the integral for the bounded area between uh, for the bounded area below the x-axis. Some students had their terminals or expressions the reverse of what was required. So as you can see here, the big takeaway would be some students split the integral up, which was unnecessary, um, which is unnecessary. So you always want to be saving yourself times in these things. So let's minimize that. We've got a line of working, we've got that, because it was a two marker. Let's keep on rolling. Okay, so we're nearly there. Let's come here in which we are told now, let P of X be equal to this, in which A is a real number. State the values of A for which F of X is equal to P of X. So on the face of it, it looks like it's asking us 
where these two things are equal. So we can use our CAS to do that. The first thing I would do is first define what this is. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to go P of X. Then I'm going to go control this. And now I'm going to type all this in. Now we have to be really careful here. And I'm actually going to show you how I think many people would mess this up. So I'm going to actually enter it in incorrectly and see if you can spot where I have so where I have done so incorrectly. It's going to be tricky. So keep your eye out on what I'm doing right now and where you think the mistake is going to be. All right, I hit enter. All right, let's now look at what P of X is. So as you can see, that P is bold. All right, there is a mistake in there. I have not correctly done it. What is wrong? What is wrong here is this A of this AX. As you can see, this multiple, those dots are multiplication signs. And because there isn't a dot between the A and the X, it's actually reading it as one thing. So the way that we change that is if I come here and I come here, I have to put a multiplication sign between them. And now that I've defined it like that, if I now get it to spit it out, now there's a dot between them and all is right in the world. Now I can solve this. So I'm going to solve for when p of x is equal to f of x for the x values and I get something atrocious. Now, why is that wrong? Why is that wrong? I've solved it and yet it's giving me something that looks absolutely bizarre and that's because I haven't read the question correctly. It says state the values of a for which this uh, is equal to this for all of x. So I'm not looking for comma X, I'm looking for comma A. So I come back here, I get rid of X, I put A there instead, I hit enter and I get something far more reasonable, but yet again, there's a trick here. So let us get our pen and let's consider where the trick is. So one of them is A is equal to zero. And then we've got this other strange one here. What I wanna do here is equate the coefficients. So let's remind ourselves what F of X is. That's what F of X is and let's write that down. So let me grab my pen and let's say f of x is equal to, and I might do this a bit better, f of x is equal to 3x to the 4 plus 4x cubed minus 12x squared. That's what we read here. Well now, if we look at what p of x is, if a was equal to zero, if a was equal to zero, this would go away, this would go away, this a would go away, and then six times negative two is negative 12x. So in other words, if a is equal to zero, if a is equal to zero, then f of x is equal to p of x. And that's your answer. Let's now look at the examiner's report and see what they've written there. Uh, I'll put this over here, so it's a bit trickier. Oh, okay, let's bring this up here. So as you can see here, 49% of people got this correct. A is equal to zero was the answer. And as we read here, some students gave an additional expression, this, which was obtained if technology was used rather than equating the coefficients. And as you can see, that's what we were given right here. That's that. So really important, not just to always uh, blindly read what's on your CAS, but you need to be thinking uh, about other ways. So A equals zero is the answer there. And let's leave that there and let's keep on going. Equating coefficients into interesting stuff. Next, it says find the solutions to the derivative of P is equal to zero in terms of A where appropriate. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're gonna come here and I need to solve for where my derivative is equal to zero. So I'm going to solve and then I'm going to go shift minus to get this up. I'm differentiating with respect to X. Then I'm going P of X. I am then setting that equal to zero. And I think that is actually confusing it. That equals zero has to be there. And um, doing that for the X values. Because it says in terms of A, not for, okay, so we're gonna do that. And we're going to get these answers out. Before we write them down, what is this? What is that actually graphically finding? Well, if I set the derivative equal to zero, I'm finding stationary points. Am I not? I am. These are stationary points. So when I read off my answers here, so one of them is x equals zero, sorry, x equals one rather, 
and this is a one marker so I don't have to show any working. Uh, then the next one is going to be x is equal to, now yet again a negative factor has been taken out which means my answer is going to be plus or minus the square root of 1 minus a and then I'm going to have a minus 1 out there as well. That is going to be your answers and those represent three stationary points. So this thing has three stationary points. Let's come and look at the examiner's report here. So let's open this up. Oh, that's annoying, is it not? It is. Okay, so as you can see here, 57% of people got this correct. So got the full one mark, x is equal to one, which is what rewrote. And then negative one plus or minus one minus a, also what rewrote. And it says here, a common error was x is equal to this. Uh, so they forgot x is equal to one. And this, and this actually was often given. This comes from forgetting to differentiate that when differentiating p of x. Okay, all right, well, just chuck it in your cas and you'll be fine. So let's just leave it at, put, the, whoa, put this over here. All right, let's keep on going now. So we've just found three stationary points. Let's go into the next question. It says, find the values of A for which P has only one stationary point. So now you're probably realizing why I stopped here to talk about what this was. Many people would have just answered G, done it, and not actually thought about what they had done. And they would not have thought about that these were stationary points. And then they would have come to H and they'd have been like, oh gosh, what, what stationary points? What am I doing here? Without realizing that G has set us up. They are preparing you for H because they've already gotten you to find the stationary points. And now they're asking, well, find the values of A for which P has only one stationary point. Well, whenever I'm asked a question like that and I see a square root sign, I know that a square root breaks as soon as the thing underneath it is less than one. So I know that this stationary point, these two stationary points will die, leaving me only with one if one minus a is less than zero. So that means if I go one minus a is less than zero, that means, sorry, if I do this, I could bring across that a like that. Therefore, a is greater than one. So when a is greater than one, I only have one stationary point. And I really, really want to stress how important it is to use the previous question to answer this one. That is such an important skill when doing these exams. Don't treat everything fresh. Uh, things aren't always isolated. Sometimes they are, but sometimes you've got to look back on what you've previously done to help you answer the next question. All right, let's now look at the examiner's report to that. So we're saying A is greater than one. And we look over here and sure enough, only 18% of people got this correct. Wow. And as you can see, A is greater than one, which is what we wrote there. This question was not answered well. Common incorrect answers were A is equal to one, A is equal to zero, or A is equal to, uh, A is greater than zero. So there you go. The importance of just making sure to you read the question before and you kind of are just reflecting on what is happening. Don't blindlessly do something. If they're asking you to solve when the derivative is equal to zero, you know what that is. That is stationary points. So think about that. And then when you come to this question, you see the word stationary point and you know, the juices are flowing. All right, next, find the minimum value of P when A is equal to two. Okay, so again, let's stop for a moment and think about what's happening here. If A is if a is equal to two, well, that means that a is greater than one. And that means I'm only going to have one stationary point. Are you with me? So even before we've thought about answering this question, we saw a is equal to two. Well, we just found that if a is equal to two, that's greater than one. And if a is greater than one, that means I only have one stationary point. If it's asking me to find the minimum, well, the minimum is a stationary point. The minimum is a stationary point, think of that. It's a stationary point. So that means my stationary point is going to occur at x equals one because I know that when a is greater than one, I have one stationary point and that one stationary point is going to be this one right here, x is equal to one. So that means I know that this minimum value of p is going to occur when x is equal to one. Now, 
that's not going to be the answer because it wants the value of p so that means we're going to have to sub one into it uh, and there's also another way you could think about this but let's now answer this so i think the major way the, the most common way people would uh, approach this question is they would say all right i'm finding the minimum when a is equal to two so that means i'm going to go function so menu calculus i'm finding the function minimum when p of x Uh, comma x so I'm finding the minimum of P then control this this and I'm going to go when a is equal to 2 so this is going to give me the X value of my minimum when a is equal to 2 and I believe that's going to be x equals 1 based on everything we've seen so far and sure enough it is now I need the p value of that so what I'm now going to have to go do is p of 1 control this that a is equal to 2 so that means the p value so the output when any x is equal to 1 is going to be negative 13 so I come over here and I'm going to write negative uh, 13 that is going to be the answer to that one. We come over here. Let's look at the examiner's report to see how people approach this. As you can see, 53% of people got the full one mark. A is equal to two. This PR, let's, I think you, the minimum value is negative 13. It's a one marker, so the min value is that I don't believe you would have had to have written this because that would be a line of working as long as you wrote the min value is negative 13 you should be in the clear uh, this question was answered well the minimum value needed to be stated not just the coordinates of the turning point okay let's keep on going next if P has only one stationary point find the values of a for which P of X is equal to zero has no solutions Whew. all right so this is the last question it's a two marker we're gonna to have to show some working here let's take it slowly let's read the first line again if P has only one stationary point well if P has only one stationary point if P has only one stat point we know where it's occurring it occurs at x equals 1 that's what we know we also know that the min is going it's, it's going to be a minimum that the min is going to be the min of p is going to be equal to p of 1 okay so now if I put 1 into that so if I come over here now actually before I do this before I do this, let's actually give it a sketch because I, I feel I'm going to lose people here. If P has only one stationary point, it occurs at X equals zero. And we also know, we also know that A is going to be greater than one. That is what we know. X is going to be equal to zero and A is going to be greater than one. Based on what we've seen in this thing right here, we know it's going to be a minimum as well. We know that this stationary point, which occurs at x equals 0, is x equals 1, is going to be a minimum. But let's say you are a little shaky on that, and you're like, I just don't really understand that. Well, let's come to our CAS, and let's just play around a little bit. And hopefully things will become clear. So let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. And let's go tab. And let's graph P of X. And now when we do that, they've got that A, and it's going to say, do you want to add A as a slider? Now, you'd be careful when you do this, because we're going to have to change things when we go back into the calculator, but let's just do it for now. All right, so here it is. So at the moment, can I move this? I can't move it. Oh, no. That's right. That's right. You can see me sliding the scale. So as you can see here, when a is equal to negative three, I have, or negative one or whatever, I have more than one stationary point. I have three stationary points, one, two, and three. So as you can see, as I move it around, I have three stationary points. But as soon as I make it above one, according to what I've just found out, I should only get one stationary point. So I'm gonna move it there. Look, when a is equal to two, I only get one stationary point. And I could keep moving it up 
And as you can see, as a is greater than one, I only get one stationary point. And that one stationary point is occurring, uh, as a minimum, is occurring there at x is equal to one. And I could change this to a number like seven. And as you can see, it is a stationary point, a minimum at x is equal to one. That is what's happening here. So now, as we come back to this question here, let me minimize this. As we come to this question, it says, if P has only one stationary point. Okay, so that means we're dealing with something that looks like this. At X equals one, we're going to have a minimum where A has to be greater than one. So again here, what I would write is that my minimum of P is going to be equal to P of one. Okay, and what's that going to be? So now this is where you have to be careful. As I come back here, because I've been playing around with the scale, it thinks A is equal to seven. So I'm actually going to have to delete that. So menu, actions, delete variable, just delete A. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, what is P of one? P of one is that. Okay, so P of one is my minimum. So this is my minimum right here. So I'm gonna come and I'm gonna write that down. My minimum is a squared minus six a minus five. And it's very important that you note that this is where a is greater than one. So my minimum is when p of one is equal to that, where a is greater than one. All right, now that we've done that, what's the next thing we have to do here? Well, as you can see here, it says find the values of a for which p of x equals zero has no solutions. Well, what does this mean? This is basically saying x-intercepts. So when does this have no x-intercepts? And this is really the beautiful thing about this whole question one. This is exactly what we were asked at the very beginning of this question. So remember, we found the minimum here, and then we were asked, what would I have to plus onto this function in order for it not to have x-intercepts? And in order for that to happen, this negative 32 has to be positive, right? It has to be positive. So we have to plus 32 to it, and it had to be greater than 32 as well. So B was greater than 32. Uh, in order for it to be above the x-intercept, above the x-axis, and therefore for me not to have x-intercepts. So just like how we started the question, now we're going to end by doing exactly the same thing. We're going to say, well, P of x equals zero will not have solutions when the minimum of P is greater than zero. So just like at the beginning, just like at the beginning, we had to take the minimum above the x-axis. So too here, we're going to have to say that my minimum is going to have to be greater than zero. <clears throat> and that's what's happening here. I have to make it greater than zero. And I have to also say, and a is greater than zero. Sorry, a is greater than one. A has to be greater than one. So that's what I'm doing. So let's just recap that. I know that I have a minimum and x is equal to one. That's how I got this value right here. This is my output. In the same way as I go up here, negative two was my input and negative 32 was my output. Therefore, in order for this thing right here not to have x-intercepts, the output here, this negative 32, had to be above the x-axis. So negative 32 had to be greater than zero. So too, down here, I have a squared minus six, a minus five, which is my uh, minimum, and it has to be greater than zero to be above the x-axis. That's what's happening here. So now as I come here, I'm going to solve this, and I'm obviously not going to do it by hand. I'm going to use the CAS. I'm going to go solve this right here for when it is greater than zero for my A values. I'm going to hit enter, and I'm going to get two things out. Now, I also know that A has to be greater than one, so I can ignore this one, and I can go straight to this one. So that means A has to be greater than the square root of 14 plus three. That is what it's going to be. When A is greater than that, I'm going to have no solutions to this, which means I'm going to have no x-intercepts. Let me highlight that because that's the important line right there. Let's bring this up. Let's have a look here. Let's have a look here. So this says, 
4% of people got this right. So it was a tricky question. We had to solve for when p of x is greater than zero for a when x is equal to one. And that's what we did. And we found out that a is equal to that as a is equal to one. So I'm, I'm that paranoid that I want to write it exactly as they wrote it. So as a is greater than one. Okay, uh, this question was not answered well. Many students did not attempt this question. Some students solved this or this. Others tried to apply the discriminant to a cubic equation. Others who used a correct method sometimes gave an incorrect inequality. For example, this one right here. So they didn't take note of the fact that a was greater than one. This is a lesson. This question is a lesson in looking at the question before and really picking up on those little clues, like the very fact that the same logic at the very beginning was applied again. Also, if you're not sure about something, chuck it into your CAS. So in the same way that we came here and we went tab, tab, and we put P of X in, and we added in a slider. That's not something we do often put in sliders, but if it helps you, you know, go for it. Just be careful that when you go back, whatever the slider is here, that's what your calculator remembers it as. So if we come over here, oh, let me just, what the, what is that? Oh, that other one stayed. Okay, whatever. Wait, let me go back. This is a pretty dodgy way to end this video. Okay, there we go. Oh, it's still there. There we go, it's gone. Okay, so as you can see, uh, as soon as A is greater than one, I have one, st I have one stationary point. And now what I'm being told is that when A is greater than this, I should have no X intercept. So if I come here and I go control C and I come here and I come over there and I put that in, as soon as I put this in, I should get one X intercept, sorry. So as soon as I put this in, I should get one X intercept. So it should just be touching the X intercept. And sure enough, it just touches it once. It touches it once at that point. As soon as it's more than that point, as soon as it is more than that point, I get no X intercepts. So just to hammer home that point, if we were to let, if we were to define A as being equal to this, and then come to our graph, and then go menu, analyze, zero, for this to this, you can see I have one X intercept at X is equal to one. But remember, we didn't want any X intercepts. So that's why it had to be greater than that point right there in order for it to achieve that. I feel like I'm repeating myself now, but hopefully you found this useful. I know I took a long time to get through it all, but these uh, videos aren't really meant to show you the speed you should be working at. You should obviously be working a lot faster than this, but it's to take you through the logic of these questions and just kind of soak it all in and absorb it. Hopefully you found it useful. And if you've got any questions, uh, come find me and we can talk about them. All right, bye-bye.